uh, I'm the National Secretary of the Socialist Equality Party in Australia, which is the Australian section of the IC of the Fourth International. We published the World Socialist website. Uh, we became aware of WikiLeaks like most media organisations in 2006, 2007. We began to follow the publication of whistleblower leaks it was making. And in 2010, again, like every media organisation in the world, we responded uh, very, very energetically to the publication of firstly collateral murder and uh, then the Afghanistan logs and the uh, then the Iraq logs and of course the very very highly significant diplomatic cables which were published in November 2010. Uh, the first public meeting I spoke on on the question of Julian Assange, the first public meeting was on December the 21st, 2010, uh, at a public meeting in, in, uh, in Sydney. Uh, and since then, uh, I have been one among a number of writers for the World Socialist website who have covered uh, the issues of Assange and WikiLeaks. I, I suppose my greatest, my stepped up involvement has been in the last several years uh, when uh, the Australian SEP felt that under conditions where there was absolutely no, there was complete silence. There is complete silence in Australia, in the media, the trade unions, the parliament, the establishment, everywhere on Julian Assange. And we felt that uh, regardless of our size and our influence, we have the responsibility to seek to provide a political direction uh, and lead a fight to mobilise the undeniable mass popular support that exists in the working class and among young people for both independent media and specifically for Julian Assange. Uh, does that cover what you w wanted to hear? Or much. Uh, any questions Sorry, coming sir. from you? Yeah, well, what are those posters behind your head, please? The posters behind me are the advertisement that we're postering at universities across Sydney and uh, a similar one across Melbourne uh, for the March 3 demonstration that we have called in Sydney at Martin Place Amphitheatre at 2pm, uh, which will be addressed by John Pilger as well as myself and other representatives of our youth movement and hopefully some other speakers which we're negotiating with. Uh, in Melbourne, we will be holding a demonstration on March 10th at the uh, steps of the Melbourne or the uh, Victorian State Library in Swanston Street. So we're currently engaged in a uh, the broadest campaign, both in the streets of Sydney and Melbourne, but above all through the World Socialist website and through social media with the very, very welcome and uh, generous uh, support being provided by the broader WikiLeaks community uh, to promote these rallies. Uh, and uh, we have a very, very specific political demand that we are making, uh, which I can elaborate. Well, uh, one would hope that you'd get a good turnout. Uh, there was a poll that was taken after um, Pamela Anderson appeared on the 60 Minutes program here in Australia, in which a huge number of Australian people do not believe Assange should be arrested. They, they basically support him. So you might have a lot to tap into there. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about 71%? About, uh, 91%. I'm being told off camera here by my expert, Kathy Bogan, uh, whose apartment I'm in. That 91% of Australians support. How do you get 90? How do you get those kind of people out there to put pressure on the Australian government, which seems to be taking its orders from Washington on a whole host of things, including not defending their own citizen? How do you tap into that? Well, firstly, big question. It's, it's, okay. Well, it's it's firstly necessary to understand why there is not a broad 
uh, political movement, to put it in that sense, defending Assange. I mean, the the reality was at the end of 2010, in November 2010, the editors uh, and uh, uh, of all of 23 major Australian newspapers and television stations issued a joint open letter to Prime Minister, then Prime Minister, Labor Party Prime Minister Julia Gillard, denouncing her over her classification of WikiLeaks as carrying out illegal activity. Uh, declaring that WikiLeaks was part of the media and that it had to be defended uh, as a fundamental issue of freedom of speech and the freedom of the media. At that time, the trade unions also issued statements. I mean, the media union awarded Julian Assange membership uh, in recognition of his services to journalism. He was given an award, which was presented by the leader of the Australian Council of Trade Unions, the Green Party, uh, vocally was raising that Julian Assange had to be defended. Various what we call pseudo-left groupings were organising protests and demonstrations. Now, in 2011 into 2012, and I, I will note also that in, uh, I think it was February 2011, John Pilger appeared at Sydney Town Hall to an audience of about 1,500 to 2,000 people alongside independent Member of Parliament Andrew Wilkie, uh, at which Andrew Wilkie vowed uh, his passionate defence of, of Julian Assange. Now, what shift we have witnessed internationally a profound shift within that entire milieu. They have gone from uh, voicing, vowing support for independent media and freedom of speech to uh, absolute silence on Assange, combined with increasingly taking up uh, both the uh, identity politics inspired uh, sexual assault nonsense, uh, and then most sharply after during 2016, when WikiLeaks did every American voter a service and exposed the reality of and published leaks exposing the reality of the Democratic Party lead candidate Hillary Clinton, uh, they have completely shifted into denouncing Assange. Now, so under those conditions, under conditions in which Julian Assange is never mentioned in the, the, the extent he's never mentioned in the Australian media except to vilify him. Under those conditions, it is understandable that there is not a broad popular movement. They, the organisations that ordinary people traditionally look to have all lined up against Assange. And so we are making very, very clear that the only basis on which a movement will be developed is one in complete opposition to and exposing the role of those organisations. We, we make no bones about this. We are not appealing to Labor. We are not, not appealing to the Greens. We are not appealing to the unions. They are the enemies of democratic rights uh, and it takes the specific form of their hostility to WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. And so we find continually among those who were politically, not just politically, who were following events in 2010, 2011, everyone knows who WikiLeaks is. They all, they all know who Julian Assange is. The reality, though, or the stark issue is that we are now meeting 18-year-olds who have never heard of Julian Assange, right? And it's not because it's not because they're apathetic or because they're ignorant or because they're stupid. It's because they are so alienated, they so much, they so distrust the official media. They don't read the newspapers. They don't watch the television news. They get everything, all news they get comes from social media. And so the work that is being done via the alternate means, such as this forum, is, are so crucial. You know, there is not, you know, and, uh, you know, and so we're fine, like, for example, I just re relate an antidote. I mean, we, we were playing the collateral murder video at uh, the University of New South Wales and other universities this week to students who had never seen it before and they were stunned you know and they immediately recognized the importance of what wikileaks had done 
You know? So we don't know what the attendance will be. Obviously, these rallies are being prepared under conditions of blanket censorship. Uh, most notably, I mean, we got an endorsement from Roger Waters from ex Pink Floyd. You would think that would you you would think that that would warrant a, at least a a sentence in one newspaper or something in a, on an Australian television station. There has been nothing. The only media outlets in the world which have reported sorry, mainstream or official, uh, are, the, are the state-run Sputnik News and Russia Today. In, uh, in, uh, it has been, oh, sorry, and, and a number of uh, South American publications which have translated it in, into uh, Spanish. I mean, the Democratic Party is located in the United States. Why should that have any impact on how Australians view the work of one of their citizens? If you could help me oh, to understand that, I, I do believe that I do believe that it's a partisan issue in the U.S. That when he was revealing, as I said earlier, Republican crimes, the liberal media loved him, and then when he re revealed corruption by the liberals, he's become this ogre and smeared. So, well, why should that's understandable, even if wrong in the U.S. But why should that be here in Australia, a, an issue? I don't get it. All right. Well, well, let's just backtrack in. November 2010, the Labor Party government responded to the exposure of the war crimes in Afghanistan and Iraq by denouncing WikiLeaks for illegal activity. Right. In other words, the Australian establishment from the very outset, the major parties of the Australian establishment responded to the exposure of US war crimes by aligning with the, the American establishment against WikiLeaks. And you're asking why? Well, Australia is in a military strategic alliance with the United States. And it, and it has been formally since 1951, informally since the uh, entry of Japan into World War II. Now, the Australian ruling elite, the capitalist class, I hope you don't get offended by me using that term. Uh, no, Australian <laughs> capitalist class has enormous economic interests around the world. It has massive investments in the United States. It has massive strategic investment and dominance over significant areas of the South Pacific, countries such as Papua New Guinea, even into Indonesia and so on. And it views the, its alliance with the United States as critical to the interests of a small minority of the Australian population, that is the, the financial and corporate aristocracy. And above all, it views the determination of the US capitalist class to prevent China, the Chinese capitalist class, emerging as a rival to American dominance as in its interests. So what was revealed in the diplomatic cables, for example, that WikiLeaks published, right? Among the thousands and thousands of documents were a number of cables from the embassy in Canberra, the US embassy in Canberra. And what was revealed in those cables is that the US embassy has in, had inside at the highest levels of the Labor Party, the trade unions, and while it wasn't in the cables, we can extrapolate in every other political, the Liberal Party, the National Party, had what it calls protected sources, right? These are individuals who would travel to the US em embassy and provide briefings on the internal discussions of the Australian government, including discussions on ousting the prime minister and replacing him, that at the time his name was Kevin Rudd, uh, who was not, who was, he was by no means against the US alliance. What he was arguing was that the US should negotiate with China. And so he was ousted in June 2010 and replaced with Julia Gillard. Now, Julia Gillard was the government who uh, denounced WikiLeaks as illegal. And the reasons why were demonstrated approximately one year later in November 2011 when I don't know if you know, but Barack Obama travelled to Australia. He was given the floor of the Australian Lower House of Parliament, a joint sitting, and he announced what was called the Pivot to Asia. 
that is a wholesale US military strategic economic confrontation with China, including the stationing for the first time since World War II of US Marines, US troops on Australian soil in Darwin, and the opening up, the wholesale opening up of all Northern Australian air bases to uh, US long range nuclear capable carrying bombers, uh, and the wholesale opening up of Australian ports to US warships and a discussion which is still going on about converting uh, Stirling, <clears throat> Stirling, that's a naval base in the city near the city of Perth in Western Australia to host US aircraft carriers. I mean, so to answer your question, the reason for the hostility of the Australian establishment to WikiLeaks is the US alliance. They are, compl and their hostility the to it doesn't matter whether the US is headed by the Republicans or the Democrats. The Australian right. government, the Australian establishment, recognises that there's not a dime worth of difference between the two. They both represent American big business interests, American imperialist interests. Yes, there are nuances between them, but the transition in this country between uh, a love fest for Barack Obama to collaborating openly with the Trump administration was seamless. I want to bring in Kathy Vogan in a second to continue the discussion. Kathy sitting right next to me here. But uh, you said in 2010 that the Australian government condemned WikiLeaks for revealing that war crimes video and other documents and um, from WikiLeaks. But did the Australian media, the corporate media, the big media here, did they publish that information and did they also condemn Assange or were they just giving the facts oh, no. to the no, public? No. And I'm even including the Murdoch, the Murdoch media. No, no. At the time, I mean, like every every m official media publication in the world, the, uh, the, the mainstream media in Australia published virtually everything that WikiLeaks exposed. I mean, if I, I, I get, I mean, this is a fundamental legal point. If you want to prosecute WikiLeaks, you have to prosecute the New York Times, the Washington Post, and in Australia, the Sydney Morning Herald was one of its uh, listed collaborators. The Sydney Morning Herald was actually used by Wiki, WikiLeaks actually gave to the Sydney Morning Herald the Australian-related diplomatic cables. They were above all published through the, the media. And as I said, I mean, at, in, 20, at, in late 2010, the the position elaborated by the editors of all Australian newspapers and television stations was that, and I'm quoting them, WikiLeaks is part of the media and had to be defended. Now, but there was a definite shift in that the, the government was hostile from the outset. The media was, I think as John Pilger has pointed out about in relationship to the, um, the sordid role of the, of the Guardian, um, you know, they profited from what WikiLeaks had done, right? But after the events in Tunisia, which was called the first WikiLeaks revolution, there was a marked shift internationally, including in this country. All of the official media recognised the danger of telling people the truth. It was one thing to expose the crimes in Afghanistan and Iraq. It was quite another to publish the diplomatic cables, which revealed that every day in the background, behind the scenes, behind the backs of the population, what goes on is a sordid intrigue between American officials and governments and corporations in every country. And in Tunisia, that sparked mass. Um, a man was so uh, outraged by what WikiLeaks had revealed and so bereft of perspective and so derived of any thought of how he could change the situation that he, that he set himself on fire, a young unemployed 26 year old Tunisian worker. And that provoked a revolution. It didn't, it's not the cause of the revolution, but it was a trigger, right? And that was then followed by what you would have to argue was the greatest upsurge of the international working class since Tiananmen Square in China, that is the events in Egypt in February 2011. Now, the, all those who defend the powers that be, and above all, all those who defend the right of a tiny 
the top 10%, the top 1%, the top 0.1%, 0.01% to monopolize the world's wealth, the capitalist class, all of those who defend that system responded uh, by decide, by, it was almost like an, they didn't even need to discuss it. It was a, like an unconscious mutual agreement. Abandon WikiLeaks, crack down on it, destroy it. We are not, go they, they were not going to allow the WikiLeaks model to extend and develop around the world. That is media independent of massive corporations such as News Limited uh, or media independent of the state controlled agencies such as the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, the British Broadcasting, you know, BBC, and so on. I mean, we're talking about yep. class issues here. Go on, sorry. And yet the class, the capitalist class, which I don't mind using myself, uh, owned the new, the major newspapers in 2010 when the, they decided to publish uh, WikiLeaks. So they, was there a rebellion in the edit, editor's uh, suites against their owners, in your view? And that suddenly they mm -hmm. fell in line when it, they saw the social upheaval that WikiLeaks could cause in the Middle East? Well, I think what they recognised was that, look, initially, what was the, 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 the initial revelations on Afghanistan and Iraq related to events that had taken place in the past, right? And they could all be blamed on George Bush, Dick Cheney, you know, you know and so on. You know, what was revealed in the diplomatic cables was an ongoing enduring constant process right in other words what the diplomatic cables exposed was that afghanistan and iraq were not aberrations they were not accidents they were not the product of the mindset of a group of right-wing neocons in the bush administration they were the day-to-day -day out they were the outcome of the day-to-day -day policies of american imperialism and that they were continuing unchanged under the candidate for hope and change, Barack Obama. And what was being, what was exposed in Tunisia and Egypt, or what was revealed, sorry, in Tunisia and Egypt, was that masses of people will not accept that world. They will rise up against it. If they have, if they know the truth, if they have information, and if they have a, a, a political perspective, they will fight. And once the masses enter into the political situation, the whole equation changes. And so, again, I don't know what, I don't even believe it was a conscious decision. I don't believe there was a sort of a, a Skype call among the top executives of every media organization in the world. I believe they just simply drew the necessary, they drew conclusions based on the class interests that in the final analysis they defend, right? It's one thing to expose the criminality and corruption of a particular government. It's another thing to call into question the very fabric of the system in which those governments operate. And so, look, after, after the Egyptian events, I mean, you can, I've made a habit since uh, about August 2010 of keeping a chronology every week I just update what's happened with Julian Assange and WikiLeaks and you can just trace you can trace the shift I mean it's a profound shift and it didn't and it took time but it filtered through to everything I mean the trade unions around the world the pseudo left organizations around the world I mean I could if I had the in front of me I could send you now tweets sent by Jeremy Corbyn relating to Julian Assange as recently as 2012. Now, he's the leader of the British Labor Party. He's under ferocious attack for being, fraudulent attack for being an anti-Semite. I mean, he's being denounced as a communist and a Russian agent, and he won't say one word in defence of a persecuted journalist down the road at the Ecuadorian embassy. Why? Because in the final analysis, Jeremy Corbyn, like the Australian establishment, 
is com won't question its allegiance and alliance with the United States because it views it as in the interests of the British capitalist class. I think the other main thing that we all need to be, we, we do need to discuss is that, you know, the great issue that's confronting the World Socialist website and most independent and critical left-wing anti-war, anti-imperialist media is flagrant censorship. Um, you know, Definitely. the defence campaign of Julian Assange is part of a broader struggle by the World Socialist website against internet censorship. Uh, if you follow the site, I suspect you're aware that we have been conducting and exposing the fact that the changes to Google algorithms has resulted in a very substantial drop in our readership. And likewise, for uh, for example, Joe's website, Consortium News, for WikiLeaks itself, for uh, a whole range of uh, left-wing anti-war, anti-imperialist sites. Uh, so the issue of defending an independent and critical media uh, is one that we all need to, all those who fight for, for that concept, for, for the right to be an independent, critical journalist and actually publish the truth, we do need to form a coalition to fight censorship. And uh, we can't do it by ourselves, one by one, you know. So we uh, we did make an appeal in uh, February 2017 for such a coalition. And those of you who are listening online who are involved in independent media, I would encourage you to consider the statement that the World Socialist Website Editorial Board issued, uh, you know, because the ability of the World Socialist Website to reach its audience, such as yourself, and, you know, and... Uh, I agree. I mean, each day I read the World Socialist website and learn, for example, about a mass strike taking place on the Mexican border with the United States by tens of thousands of auto and auto parts Mexican workers calling for support from their American brothers. While in, the Mar while in Washington, they're preoccupied with building a wall to separate the American and Mexican working class. You know, the, uh, there are fundamental issues underway. Uh, we live in a we live in days where the working class is resurgent. Uh, I think you'll get a sense from the World Socialist website of that. I mean, each day now we're reporting on growing strike movements and protest movements by the working class around the world. And that's what uh, has to be developed into a conscious political movement for change. And it's also the great social force, the great social movement that can bring about the freedom of Julian Assange and other persecuted journalists, dissidents, whistleblowers, and so on. Right. But you were talking about um, Jeremy Corbyn. Um, so you really basically think that um, he's somebody who's never going to fight for the uh, working class, that he's just a sellout to corporate interests? Or do you have some hope for Corbyn? No, I have no hope for Corbyn. Okay. <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn is what he is. Jeremy Corbyn is a lifelong member of the British Labour Party, one of the key pillars of British, the British state. Uh, he he served as a purpose as a sort of a left voice of dissent for a, for decades. At a certain point, they needed, in order to revive the fortunes of the Labor Party, they needed a figure like Corbyn, and he was elevated into the leadership with uh, and considerable. Uh, look, ordinary people don't understand all the histories of things. They viewed they took Corbyn at his word. When Corbyn said he was a socialist, that he wanted, you know, uh, that he was going to defend the National Health Service, that he was going to uh, uh, repudiate the Trident submarine program, that he was going to, you know, he was going to take a stand against war, they believed him. Now, the record is that since becoming Labor leader, he has continually accommodated himself to the Blairite right wing wing of the Labor of the uh, of the British Labor Party. Uh, and, I mean, it's not just a question that he's impotent. I mean, he's collaborating with them. I mean, they're actually now, we, our, our, mem our party in Britain, the Socialist Equality Party in Britain, commented recently on the, the phenomena where you had a Labour Party branch move to expel one of the Blairites from the, Labor, from, from the branch 
and they intervened and expelled the people who had actually organized the expulsion. And Corbyn said nothing. I mean, he's sitting there, they're, they're denouncing him as an anti-Semite and he won't fight to defend himself. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm amazed by his reluctance to put up a fight. I mean, to, to okay. really, you know, well, it's such amazed. a dishonest campaign. <laughs> It's yeah, a, as was the campaign that he was some kind of a Putin's agent. All these are such utterly flagrantly dishonest campaigns. And he seems so inept at defending himself. I mean, it's just he's actually defending himself and he seems inept at doing it. Yeah, but he won't but to defend himself would mean taking it would mean fighting the British state. And he's not going to do that. He's not going to fight British capitalism. The Labour Party never has. He's, he actually, his, his actual political role is to defend it. I mean, it's like it's very Syriza. Similar to the situation in the US. Sorry? No, I was going to say that it's very similar to the situation in the US. And, yes. you know, not to spout my own political beliefs, but when I see somebody like Bernie Sanders towing the Russiagate narrative rather than even defending himself or defending his followers who were cheated in the Democratic primary, that can be very frustrating too. So I think that that, that phenomena is one that is definitely going on in a lot of Western countries. For sure. Well, I think, and right. and I think the the stage we're at internationally is it's it's really crucial that all those who consider themselves progressive in defence of democratic rights, all those who who consider themselves anti-war, who oppose above all social inequality, you it is time that conclusions be drawn from immense political experiences. You are not going to change the situation through Bernie Sanders. Jeremy Corbyn, uh, Cortez, you know, the, the new faces of the Democratic Party, you know, who also won't say a word about Julian Assange or any other principled issue. Um, or Venezuela. You know, of I mean, course. Most of course. She said nothing about Venezuela. Yeah, okay. Well, it's time that conclusions are drawn in America, in Britain, in Germany, in France, or every country as to the role in Greece about Syriza about what these organizations are. Spain with Podermos, they do not represent any genuine alternative. They actually are a, a safety valve for the establishment while behind the scenes, we all know what's being prepared. They're preparing a police state. You know, the attack on WikiLeaks Absolutely. is inseparable from the growth of the of this of the uh, the the apparatus of a, of a police state. The reason they above all why they hate Julian Assange isn't so much. It's even greater now. I mean, the Vault Seven leaks provoked you know blind fury in the American state apparatus. I mean, remember, I mean that was when Pompeo came out and said, from now on, we're going to treat them as a non-state hostile intelligence service. Because they had exposed, they published leaks exposing the fact that the CIA is the greatest purveyor of malware, the greatest purveyor of, of intrusive software, that it takes over Samsung television sets, that it tried to develop software to take over motor vehicles, uh, control systems. Joe, do you mind if I just come back to the demonstrations that we're calling and perhaps give listeners and sort of an explanation of what their motives are. Please go ahead. Well, the, the demonstrations are making a demand on the Australian government. That is that the Australian government does have the diplomatic power. It does have what you, is correctly defined as the legal discretion, that is the legal choice, to intervene, uh, to secure or to essentially compel the British government to allow to drop the bail charges, the bail related charge, which is the only revealed criminal charge against Julian Assange. They do have the power to compel Britain to drop that charge so he can walk out of the, U of the Ecuadorian embassy and if he wants to do so, return to Australia, providing the Australian government has given a guarantee that he will not be extradited from Australia to the United States, though the legal opinion that we have received last year makes there would be a very powerful case which would be conducted in the Australian courts uh, to defeat any US extradition warrant on the grounds that it's a violation of international law uh, and a violation of Australian law. So 
we think under these under condi- under the conditions current conditions that given that a, Julian is an Australian citizen that the uh, pressure that we exert in this country is absolutely crucial to the international fight for his freedom right i mean obviously we completely support and solidarize ourselves with the protest actions and all the actions being taken by defenders of wikileaks around the world but specifically the australian government does have the ability to place immense diplomatic pressure upon the government of great britain um i i just want to point out that the he's not been charged with skipping bail there's simply an arrest warrant if they arrested him they could charge him with that or they could just shuffle him off to heathrow and onto a plane it's definitely culturally interesting though to to witness the way in which australia and australian culture which kind of prides itself in my opinion on being um going against the grain and and there was a lot of criticism in australia on the ground for the you know second war in iraq leading up to that it's really depressing t- for me to hear that in Australia, that same culture is not doing that, uh, is not following through in standing up for Julian Assange, that they aren't kind of bucking the establishment when it comes to his case in, for WikiLeaks. I think that's really sad. So. Can I just make also, a point? Elizabeth? Sorry, just Joe. The point, what Elizabeth just referred, raised, is, is an important issue about the, the, the Iraq war protests in 20, 2002 and 2003. The, the demonstrations in cities such as Melbourne and Sydney were among the largest in the world. I mean, I was at the, obviously the one in Sydney. I mean, by some credible estimates, there were up to 400 to 500,000 people there. That is about one in every five, one in every eight citizens of Sydney. Now, what has to be, rather than getting depressed about it, what we, we have to remember <laughs> that the organisations that led that anti-war movement the trade unions, the Greens, uh, a number of other organisations. In fact, the main speaker in Sydney was John Pilger. Um, Now, apart from figures like John Pilger, those organisations have thoroughly shifted to the right. In the wake of the financial crisis in 2008, the greatest shock to world capitalism really since the Depression, uh, in the wake of the Uh, eruption of international class struggle above all in Egypt, all of these organisations which, while yes, they were opposed to certain aspects of what US imperialism was doing, they do not oppose capitalism. And they have all lurched to the right. I mean, I think there are many, many people who are part of the WikiLeaks defence movement and part of the broader Uh, campaigns and and issues to defend refugees, to defend immigrant rights against the growth of neo-fascism and so on, that they're not actually conscious that they're actually uh, reflecting broad anti-capitalist sentiment. And that has to be translated into conscious anti-capitalist sentiment. Uh, You know, now, I'm not trying to issue a political treatise, but we, you know, you are not going to overcome the, what you referred to as the the ignorance and so on among ordinary people, except through the most determined fight to build a new political movement. You know, we're not going, you're not going to reform the Democratic Party in America. You're not going to reform the Labor Party. You're not going to turn the Green Party in Australia back from a, you know, a sordid identity politics riddled, you know, bankrupt organisation into some type of movement fighting for, for, for genuine change. We have to develop a movement. Could not agree the, more. Yeah, we have to develop a I, movement I could not agree in the working class. And the the most important developments in the United States are the, the the is the struggle by the Socialist Equality Party and a growing layer of of workers uh, to organise new independent organisations. Um, you know, we held a demonstration in Detroit. It, you know, it wasn't a huge demonstration, but it was historically significant. You know, on February 9th in Detroit, workers gathered completely independent of the unions and demanded a fight to defend thousands of working class jobs which are being destroyed in, Det- in Hamtramck, in Ontario, in Canada. They, de- they called for unity with workers in Mexico. Uh, you know, now that's, you know, 
that's the way forward. You know, the way forward is through the independent mobilization of the working class. And, and I actually believe that the, the movement that is developed has developed and it's been done through Unity for J through many other mechanisms, but the movement developing around Julian Assange, you know, is an important contribution to a broader political radicalization in the working class. And, you know, we can't, uh, what's the, what am I trying to sort of convey? The uh, massive social change doesn't, begins among a conscious, politically determined, politically directed minority. And that's what I believe we're, we're seeking to forge. Well, James, at the beginning of the vigil, I read out a uh, statement that the San Francisco Labor Council, spurred on by American Postal Workers Union member, uh, actually got a resolution passed, Labor Council being a conglomeration of various unions in San Francisco in the Bay Area, uh, supporting Julian Assange and asking that he be free and condemning any uh, attempts to extradite him. A, how significant you think that might be in terms of, uh, I know how you feel about the established unions. Is that when a significant he... thing? I could, could that happen to, when did that happen on Wednesday, I believe this week? And could that happen here in Australia, in, in your opinion? And if not, is, what does that say about the US and Australia? Uh, look, I don't discount that as a result of uh, what is, of course we don't discount that what we're doing uh, independently of all these organisations will result in figures within those organisations uh, or, you know, actually shifting their position. You know, it would not shock me in the slightest, for example, if as a result of the uh, work that we're doing in with the support of figures such as John Pilger, you know, to call these demonstrations, if there is a shift in the attitude of members of parliament, if voices do start to get raised. I mean, we, in that sense, that's part of what we're seeking to do. We are seeking to pressure through a movement from below. We are seeking to pressure the political establishment, which includes the trade unions, to fight, you know, to, to uh, intervene to uh, secure the freedom of Assange. If you have such a development, and I'm not aware of it, uh, in on the West Coast, uh, in, where, where did you say, San Francisco? Correct, San Francisco Labor yeah. Council. Okay, well, uh, then that is an interesting development, and it reflects the fact that uh, sections of the union apparatus are well aware that the persecution of Julian Assange does not have support among their members and among the broader working class. The unions act... Uh, James, to... Uh, oh, so, sorry. sorry to interrupt. I mean, I was just... Um, so, sorry, Jeff. I was just wondering, do you see a, a growing labor radicalism at the moment worldwide? I mean, do you think that somehow in the last couple of years there is actually a growing radicalism among uh, labor? Yes. Yeah, we, at the beginning of 2018... In a statement written by our the uh, chairman of our international editorial board, David North, I mean, he he said, "2018 will be characterised by the resurgence of the international class struggle," and that prognosis was completely verified. Right, 2018 witnessed a steady growth. I mean, for example, it was the largest the year of the largest number of strikes in the United States in something like 35 years, and that has and 2019. The first weeks of 2019 have just been marked by a veritable eruption of class struggle around the world, the most significant feature of which, or significant features of which are three things. One, uh, there is an almost instinctive recognition that the issues that face workers are international, they're not national. Two, that the great issue of politics is social inequality. It's not what colour you are. It's not what gender you are, it's what your class is. Social inequality is the great political divide, the great issue of world politics. And thirdly, and very, very importantly, movements such as the, the Yellow Vest, developments in France, uh, the uh, eruption on the Mexican, among the Macwoodlet or the uh, workers in uh, in Mexico, they're all take, they're taking place outside of and in some cases, direct rebellion against the trade unions. 
I mean, in Mexico, the workers carried a banner. The company and the unions are killing us. Yeah. Because, the you know, I mean, you've got rebellions taking place among teachers across the United States over the appalling conditions that they're for, for, forced to work under and even more, in, shockingly, the conditions of the children that they have to try to teach. Children coming to school who haven't eaten, you know, who can barely clothe themselves, you know. The same issue in Britain, you know, where poverty has never been greater. Now, the, you know, so the the resurgence of what you characterize as labor radicalism, I mean, we're, we're just referring a resurgence of international class struggle. Now, it doesn't have conscious leadership. It doesn't have conscious perspective. And so it can be exhausted. The Yellow Vest movement has been going for, what is it now, 14? Is it 14 weeks? You know? Protest after protest after protest. Um, what they, what's absent is uh, the development of a, of a actually conscious perspective that ordinary people can change the society. They can form their own. They can form their own organisations and move to actually carry through revolutionary social change. Virtually fifty percent of the workforce has been transformed into temps, casuals, perm, you know, part timers. Yeah. The gig economy. Um, in fact, that's one of the main motivations of the class struggle, the fact that work has become so insecure, so temporary, so, um, so you know, people don't know from day to day if they have a job. Um, how do you combat? Right, of course, workers come under the enormous pressure of uh, their day to day existence, but it breaches it, you know, in any political situation, it breaches the point. Uh, Leon Trotsky described it very well. The, the working class can't tolerate the situation it faces and the ruling class can't rule the way it used to. So we've got two interconnected processes. There's a complete collapse of allegiances and belief in the, the official establishment, and so they're moving toward dictatorial forms of rule, which the attack on Julian Assange and internet censorship are an aspect. And on the other hand, you have the resurgence of the working class, the vast majority of society who are coming forward saying, we want a world in which we and our children can not only have a decent living standard, but be free from the danger of a nuclear war and the destruction of humanity through climate change. Now, the reason, one of the reasons they hate WikiLeaks and Julian Assange was that Julian Assange was providing the necessary truthful exposures that assist politically equip ordinary people to fight injustice, to fight social inequality, to fight capitalism. Now, you know, and they, in, as, as I think all of us have said in different ways, they're trying to make an example or they're trying to, by destroying or intimidating, by uh, destroying Julian Assange, hounding him into a a corner, silencing Assange, they're seeking to intimidate and silence all critical independent voices. It's the age-old method of state repression. And that's why, that's why there must be an international movement, and it's why I hope every person listening in, in Australia will make their way to Sydney and Melbourne on either March 3 and 10 and demonstrate to fight for his freedom.